In today's video, we will develop a remote exploit that will get us a shell inside a Jenkins instance on a Windows target. Before starting, do note that this video will also serve as a continuation of the previous exploit development video I posted. That means we will reuse some of the concepts we learned from that. If you haven't watched it, I highly suggest you go through it first, which you can find in the link above. Now let's create our script. Let's start it with Shebang. Then we'll import RE module since we might need to do reject searching on the HTML page. And of course, we also need request module since we are interacting with web pages. Let's do something different this time. Let's make the script customizable by allowing us to pass important settings as a parameter instead of editing and hard coding the values inside the script. So let's import ardparse as well. ardparse is a built-in Python module that allows you to pass and parse command line options. We first need to create an instance of argument parser and store it inside a variable. Let's also add some description. Let's add our first parameter, which is the target IP. This is done by using the add argument method. Dash T will be the actual option and target IP will be the variable that will contain its value. It's always better also to put a description about the purpose of the option. Last part will be doing the actual parsing by extracting all the data using the parseArg method. Before adding the rest of the parameters, let's do a quick test. We hit our first error because we forgot something. The extracted data stored in parser variable is stored in a namespace object which is not yet accessible outside that scope. We need to get access to that namespace by storing it in a variable. Once the namespace is accessible, we can now access the individual option as attributes. So this will now be our final look. Let's also add other important parameters. Okay, it's done. I also made sure that these options are always included. To verify, we can use dash H and see if all the options are available. Now we need to simulate the HTTP login request. It's better to use session objects so that we can reuse cookies throughout the connection. Then since this is a login, we will send a post request. Of course, we need to find out the login URL. So let's go to Burp. Let's copy this JSpring security check endpoint and paste it in. We also need to prepend the target IP. Actually, instead of doing it this way, let's use URL lib parse module to handle this nicely for us. Now we can pass the target URL to our post request. Then let's go to burp to find out the post data we need to send. We will need the J username and J password. I think we can ignore the from because it seems it's just an indication of your previous location, which is not that important. Same with submit, we can ignore it. Same drill, we will use a dictionary to keep our post data. We have the username and password whose values will be supplied as command line options. Let's also pass our request via burp proxy to aid us in troubleshooting. Of course, Python love dictionaries, so let's create one again. And let's test if our connection works by running the script and printing the HTML page returned. We hit our first error. Let's investigate. Let's go again to burp and check the request made from our script. At quick glance, it seems correct. There is no typo on our post parameters. We received a 302 redirect, which is a good sign. Let's have one more look on the previous valid request. Maybe we are missing the content type uh, no, we already have it. Something's not adding up. In this case, the next thing we may want to check is to see if we are getting a proper cookie. So let's go to burp history and look for requests made through Firefox. Something's odd. Did you notice that as well? When my browser sent a post request, there is a cookie included. Typically, the only time you will get a cookie is after you get authenticated, which is after that request is made. So what is this cookie? Where did this came from? To make sure this is not just some leftover cookies from previous requests, Let's clear all cookies from Firefox. Then let's close it and open again. Let's do it slowly. I'll refresh first the page to simulate a GET request to the login page and go to burp. Ah, so the server sends us a cookie on the first GET request. Then this cookie is the one being sent together on our post request. So now let's go back to our script and modify it to look for this cookie. Let's send a GET request to get that cookie. 
and check how it looks like by printing it. Let's run a few times. Okay, it's changing, which is expected as it treats each session different, and it prevents cookie reuse, which is good security practice. Let's store this cookie in a variable. I'll name it as cookie in it since this is the initial cookie we need. The Python type that was returned is not yet available for parsing, so let's use getDict method to convert it into a cookie dictionary, which will contain the cookie name and value. Let's also store the cookie name on its own variable since we might reuse it later. And I'll name the first HTTP request as R1, and the post request for login will be R2. Then pass the initial cookie to our post request that will contain our login credentials. Let's remove the re find all since we no longer need to do a regex search. The cookie is already in a dictionary, meaning we can just extract the value from it. Now that we were able to handle the initial cookie, let's do same thing for the login cookie. This will be the cookie that we will get from Jenkins once we successfully authenticated with our user credentials. I'll just use same get dict method for convenience. Since they both use same cookie name, I'll just reuse same variable. Let's rename our cookie variables to make it clear and easy to understand. Now let's build our actual payload. To do that, let's simulate the reverse shell exploitation on script console so we can have a reference that we can look at. Let's go to revshells.com. We already have a previous settings in place, so I'll just copy it. Go back to script console, put it in, and click run. Back to burp. Let's look for the request. Send it to repeater. Let's rename the tab nicely and close other distractions. Let's go back to the script and store the exploit URL in a variable. Let's still use URL join to handle this nicely for us. Save that and back to burp again. So we see here script parameter that contains a URL encoded version of our groovy reverse shell. We have this JSON representation of our payload, but not sure if it is needed. So let's ignore it for now to simplify our exploit and add it if we encounter any issues. Lastly, we have this token included in the data. This is the Jenkins crumb, which is just a fancy name for a CSERF token. Let's build our third request and name it as R3. Let's pass our exploit URL. Exploit data. Adders. And the login cookie. We forgot to build the cookie dictionary, so let's create it. This had the same format as the initial cookie. Same cookie name, but different value. Before creating the actual exploit data, let's pause for a bit to explain something. If you notice, the initial and login cookie was extracted from different places. The first was extracted from our initial get request. After that, we sent a post request together with that cookie. We then received same cookie name, but with a different value. This is our login cookie. If we were to extract our login cookie from R1, our connection will fail because we are getting an old cookie that is no longer used. So we need to extract it from our current session object to make sure we are getting fresh cookies. So be mindful on how cookies are set and deleted on every requests. Now let's build our exploit data. As usual, we need to put it inside a dictionary. First parameter will be script. We will store the actual groovy reverse shell on a separate variable. Let's do the same thing for Jenkins Chrome. Let's import some method from URL lib parse to do the URL encoding. Then let's create the variable that will store our groovy reverse shell. We need to convert this into an F string so we can pass our listener IP in port. Then update the arguments accepted by the script. Let's wrap around the entire payload inside the quote plus method. Since this payload is complicated to parse, let's do quick tests to see if it is not breaking. And we hit an F string error. Let's go back to the code. Probably some characters are breaking our payload, so let's try to create a payload builder function. And let's test it. Still hitting an issue, but a different error signature. Curly braces are critical to F strings, and our payload contains a lot of those. So instead of going through each of them, let's break our payload in two parts to make it cleaner. First section will be the actual F string containing our listener IP and port. Next one contains just a literal string with the curly braces that breaks our F string. Then let's do one final test. And finally, we get it working. The next thing we need to do is to get the Jenkins crumb. I don't expect this to be that difficult. The idea here is to send a get request to the script URL, 
Then we will intercept the response and get the crumb. Once we get the crumb, we can now include it on the final request that includes our Groovy reverse shell. We will use RE module to find the crumb. You already saw this technique on my last exploit development video, but I will demonstrate again slowly for the sake of others. Let's create a new git request for slash script. Let's move this above. Then let's start the regex parsing. Let's use find all method to return a list of matches. We will search it within the response of R3, matching the following string. We will use dot and plus sign as quantifier to match all possible values of the crumb. We will get only the first item on the resulting list. Split it in two parts using equal sign as the delimiter. Let's get the second item on the list. Remove the HTML entity using strip method. Then finally remove all double quotes using replace method. Now that we complete all necessary requirements from cookies to crumbs, we should be able to launch our exploit. Let's open our netcat listener and fire up our script. We didn't receive a callback. Let's add a proxy on all HTTP requests so we can see what's happening in Burp. I'll run again the script in the background. Then let's go back again to Burp. Let's find our request and compare it to the one that was made through Firefox. Let's send this to compare. And this one as well. Let's compare by word since we don't need to go on byte level. Left side is the successful one made through Firefox. Right side is from our script. Can you spot the problem? It looks like that our payload was URL encoded twice. When a space is URL encoded, it is converted into plus sign. If a plus sign is URL encoded, it will turn into percent %2b. So that explains why it didn't work. Let's go back to our script and remove this extra URL encode function. Let's fire up the script again. And it's fixed. Almost there. We are almost finished with the script. To make this a one command exploit, we need to use pawn tools again to launch the reverse shell and catch the connection. So let's start doing changes on our script. I'll just copy paste here the reverse shell function from our file upload exploit script, then create a separate function for delivering our groovy reverse shell exploit. Finally, we need to make sure these functions runs on separate threads so they don't block each other. And let's test this script. Error again. For some reasons, Pawn Tools didn't like that we URL encoded our payload. So let's quickly remove that function and try again. Once again, thank you for joining me until the end of this video. Please give this a thumbs up if you found it useful. Stay tuned for our next video as we will try to gain admin privilege on King's Landing to conquer the Iron Throne. See you on the next one.